Hello. What you just saw uh, there was uh, the launch of, of our book, uh, Green Leaf Moment, which I'm going to tell you all about shortly. Um, but we, we launched the book in South Africa, and uh, that, that was a few highlights. So it was a very um, exciting time when, we launch, when I've launched the book. Um, and the, the highlights, you see, we showed you that because when we... Uh, <laughs> I'll have to talk about the book. I'm a bit over, you know, as you can imagine, I'm excited, but also uh, overwhelmed to see all of you here this morning. But when we launched the book, it was such a, a powerful time because we had not seen people for over 20 years and 30 years that came to this launch because uh, I'll talk just now about my dad and his life and he had pastored many churches. So we had all these people coming in and all our family that and yet to know Jesus came, and it was just a powerful time of, of unity, of love. Uh, but before I even go into the book, um, I, there, was this, there was one scripture that stood out to me throughout this process of writing the book, even while I was uh, in South Africa. And uh, you will all know, some of you might know this scripture well, it's Matthew 22, 37 to 40, which is the great commandments that Jesus talks about. Um, and Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the, the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. These two verses, these, this whole thing of loving the Lord with all your heart, as I journeyed through this book, I felt I needed to love the Lord more. I don't know about you, but when you need the Lord to help you through something, you tend to love him even more. And I just want to encourage you, many of you sitting here have a book to write or a story to tell. Some of you, uh, you know who you, to who you are, and the Lord is saying, when you start to love him even more, if when you start to grow closer to him, seek him more, trust him more, he can bring things to pass. But the second part of the verse says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, for those of you that are here, do you you, we all know we need each other to make it in this life, in whatever we do, whatever situation you are going through right now, whatever you have gone through in your life, you know you are more victorious when you do things together. And, and these two scriptures of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, just came to the fore. But loving your neighbor, loving each other, because you see, love is reciprocal. When you give out love, you receive love. And, you know, I have found that so much with writing this book. Now, this book has been a mammoth task. Um, of writing, but I found people spurring me on on this journey. And some of you are sitting here today. You knew exactly when my book was going to the printer. You knew exactly because you were praying with me, and I needed that. And I just want to start off by saying that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of you sitting here. And some of you are yet to find that out. Some of you are yet to discover it. But when you start to love the Lord with your all, he starts to reveal things to you like never before. And when you start to come along people that truly love you, wow, that is the winning combination. And that is why those are the main two commandments that the Lord talks about, that Jesus talks about. Let's just pray even before I start talking about the book. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity uh, that I have, and I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will just um, minister to every single person that is here this morning. Lord, I just pray that you will meet us at our point of need you will speak a word uh, that is needed for each one of us. We know, Lord, that your word is powerful. Your word leads, your word guides, your word uh, sharpens, your word equips. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll come alongside 
each one that is seated here, Lord. I step aside and allow you, Lord, to speak through me your word that you've placed in my heart. So, Lord, we pray today for fertile hearts. We pray, Lord, that there will be such a fertile heart and a spirit to receive what you have for each of us today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. So some of you would have watched the program of the launch in South Africa that took place on the 30th of July. Uh, I also had the opportunity of going on a radio show where I was interviewed with Division and myself. So some of it is a bit of repetition of what the book's about, and, but lots of you are new, which is great. So I'll start from the beginning. So why have I written a book like Tracy, do you have no time? You have plenty of time, should I say? No. My dad passed away um, in 2016. My dad is Pastor Casey Chetty and is very well known in, in Durban, South Africa. And he also had the opportunity of, of coming to England four times. Uh, my mom came twice. And uh, they met with our pastors. I'll talk about all that soon. But at his funeral and leading up to his funeral, and we had the awesome opportunity of Pastor Jonathan and Kath coming along with us to the funeral in South Africa in 2016 because they became good friends to us as a family even in South Africa, my mom, dad, and family there. And when we arrived, uh, what happens in South Africa is leading up to the funeral, we have Thanksgiving services each night. For five nights, you kind of ha like have Thanksgiving services, and then you have the funeral. And each night, as people came, they talked about my dad. Because my dad, I'll talk to you about that as well, he was a Hindu who became a Christian. And when he became a Christian, his life was sold out to God. He stopped his uh, profession as a teacher, which he loved doing. This is all in the book. And he decided to follow Jesus, and he became a full-time pastor for over 40 years of his life. And as I listened to testimony upon testimony about how he had impacted people's lives, and when I sat at his funeral, I got the image of, you know, before that, I just sensed something dropped in my heart that I need to write a book. And you know when you struggle with things like this can't be right, but something dropped in my heart in 2016 uh, to write a book. And... Um, as I was sitting at my dad's funeral, I uh, saw the image. You know, we, you know the story of Noah and the ark and where it rained for nearly, you know, where they were in the ark. They rained for 40 days, but they were in the ark for nearly a year. So when the, green, when the dove brings the green leaf to Noah, I could see Noah's face because when the dove delivers the green leaf, it was the moment of happiness, it was a moment of joy, it was a moment of new beginnings, it was a moment of freshness, that green leaf moment. And then I thought of my dad's life when he received Jesus in his life, that became his green leaf moment. Hence the book is called Green Leaf Moment. And that is the thread of thought throughout the book, Green Leaf Moment, because my dad's green leaf moment then became my green leaf moment and many other people that he had gone on to uh, impact in their lives. So the book is filled with, with testimonies uh, about people that uh, my dad impacted, about uh, legacy, Rachel's testimony, my daughter's there, Kyle, my nephew's testimony is there, Pastor Jonathan's testimony is there, Steve Lamb, who's part of a Destiny Church, is there. All of these people, God used my dad to impact their lives. Now, 2016, I get this idea, right? I struggled with the idea because I knew this will take my everything to do, but come 2020 in October, Dr. John Andrews, who's a dear friend of ours, he preached here a few weeks ago, Dr. John comes, and Dr. John has written now 14 books, and something in me was tell, telling me, tell John, tell John you're writing, a, we want to write a book, and everything in me said, don't tell John, because what if John laughs or something? But I did tell Dr. John that day, and he said, Tracy, don't think of writing a book. 
just write 500 words a day. And that instilled confidence in me, and that's how I got started writing. So from the October to the April, I had written nearly 50,000 words and then started developing the book, which is now the Green Leaf Moment. So what is the book about? This book takes you on a journey of the life of, of my late dad, Pastor Casey Chetty. It talks about his life of, of conversion from Hinduism to Christianity. Then it talks about life lessons that I had. So it's written from the perspective of a child growing up, life lessons taught. One of the chapters is on lessons learned. And then the story weaves into the vision and our stories of coming to England. And then it talks about dad's impact when he was at Destiny Church. So one chapter, chapter 11, is actually called Destiny. And his gifting made room for him and he was able to come here. And it's filled with testimonies. And the other thing that the book has is pictures. I know you all like pictures, don't you? So after each chapter, there's pictures. And, and today I'm gonna pick a few pictures and talk about them and elaborate about them. So in, there's a picture, 1959, that's gonna come up, yes. I think in 1959, they told them not to smile. Do you think so, yeah? <laughs> Nobody's smiling. Generations down the line, we are really smiling. That's all I can say. I'm going to explain who's on this uh, picture. So this picture, like I said, taken in 1959, on your left is my dad's dad. That, next to him is dad's niece. Next to her is my dad's sister. Next to my dad's sister is our great granny, and she's called Rajuma. And then there's my mum. Below my mum is my, youngest, uh, my dad's youngest brother, Devraj, and in the middle is his other sister. Now, my great granny came from India. Okay, Rajma came from India, and you'll hear all, read about it in the book. That's where our roots came from. Now, Rachel always says, you know, when we go to full things, so my roots are Indian, I was born in South Africa, and now I live in England. That's very, uh, you know, confusing, right? So when Rachel goes to fill in this forms, mom, where are, what is my ethnic background? Well, I don't know, just guess, you know, we're from somewhere, but... Uh, so I've actually put this picture up because it's showing us generations. And I'm gonna talk a bit about generations. Now my great granny that came from India was a Hindu and generations before. And then my dad and all of the family were Hindus when they arrived in South Africa. So I'm fourth generation South Africa, Rachel is five, fifth generation, so five generations down the line. But it took a decision, if you, when you read the book, you'll see my dad's youngest brother, Devraj, became a Christian first, but unfortunately he passed away. But generations down the line, something needed to happen for me to be standing here this morning. My dad had to make a decision to become a Christian, and I'll tell you about that story soon. But this morning, as I was thinking about generations, we serve a God of generations. If you read through the Bible, generations is spoke to, spoke about so much. And this morning, as I'm talking to you, I just sense that for many of you sitting here, you are the start of what's going to happen in your generations to come. That's a very big thought maybe even scary thought. So my dad surrendered his life to Christ. He had his green leaf moment. It's affected my life, it's affected Rachel's life, it will affect Rachel's children and her children's children. This morning, how, how are you going to affect your generations to come? You see, so often we can be small-minded thinking decisions we make today is not gonna affect anything. Actually, it does. Decisions we make now as parents affect generations to come. The Bible talks about this in Psalm 78 verse 4. We will not hide from them, from their children, telling to generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works 
that he has done. Joel 1 verse 3 says, tell your children about it and let your children uh, tell their children and their children the next generation. This morning, decisions you going to make, maybe even today, will affect generations to come. When moments become stories of destiny, so often moments in our lives become stories that determine our destiny in life. You see, as we, we grew up and, and so forth, so many things can affect your destiny, not, e not just our salvation, but also habits. If you think of things, of habits that you might have now, you might be so small-minded in, into thinking that it's just going to affect me. No, it can move on from generation to generation. Mindsets. What is your mindset? That can move on from generation to generation. There's a verse in uh, Psalm 119 that talks about the word that gets hidden in our heart that we will not sin against Jesus. You know, and I spoke about this as I was speaking in South Africa about what is hidden in your heart. You know, when things get tough, what is it that comes out? Is it bitterness? Is it heartache? The Lord talks about hiding his word in our heart. For your generations to come, what comes out of you when things go hard? So what I'm trying to say is our decisions now will impact generations to come. It's so important that we start thinking generationally. The other thing is what we decide will be who our children will become. Now the book is a lot about my perspective obviously growing up, but also about life lessons. And uh, there's lots of hilarious stories. That's a bit of my life in that book. So tread carefully. <laughs> as you go through the book. Um, but there are lots of stories and parents. Words that you use for your children can be life-giving or they can destroy. Some, uh, Proverbs 18.21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. How many of you sitting here know that somebody spoke a word over you and it was life-giving. Anybody here? Yeah, are you still there? You're very quiet. So life-giving words. What is it you, you're sharing with people around you, your friends, your family, your children? I feel today I need to talk a lot about children, about future generations. That's quite, you know, a sense that's heavy on my heart today because you know, when I was growing up, I was fortunate to have good godly parents and good godly leaders around me that, that helped me on my journey. And this morning, all of us have the awesome opportunity of, of, of having good godly leaders like, like Pastor Faith and like other leaders in a team that are sitting around us. And I just want you to know that if we do not take the opportunity of getting our children involved in church community. They can be led astray. They can move to another community. You see, it's so easy to conform to the patterns of this world now. Parents, you can see that with our children. There's a pull going on everywhere. There's a pull. If we lose them, if they are not part of church community, then which community do they get involved in? And, 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 and that's so strong in my heart. And I'm going to just show you a few pictures that's in the book uh, about our community. Now, this was in 1999, and this was a kids' camp, a bit like what Faith had with her kids' camp just 40 years from then. Uh, but this was just us on a Sunday morning, and, and you can see my dad, a bit of the bald head here at the, in the middle. Uh, but this was just our presentation, and we, we grew up in this atmosphere. So I was one of the kids and then eventually became one of the teachers. But this is how we grew up in the community of the church. This was our community. And the next picture, please. This is my dad. We had a youth camp, and he's praying for all the youth there. A bit like when Pastor Faith took her youth 
You see, these are defining moments, parents. We need to get our kids to the right place at the right time to receive the right blessing. Otherwise, they're gonna miss out on the blessing over their lives. Now, lots of people that dad prayed over became pastors, became worship leaders, became ministers of the faith, went to different parts of the world because we were at the right place at the right time. Parents, we need to invest in our kids. More so than ever before, we need to invest. And I just want to encourage you, you know, as we move into September, as we move into a new year, if that's not your thinking, if that's not your priority, let's make it a priority. Let's face it, if your five-year-old is telling you on a Sunday morning, I want to have a movie morning, and you say, okay, or more, or worse, you are saying, let's have a movie morning. That's, you know what I mean? Let's make church a priority. Let's make church community a priority. You've got your youth that's happening on a Wednesday. You've had your kids program. Why is it dark up there? Sorry. You have your kids program that's happening. Something's happening up there. Very exciting. Uh, that's happening. You know, this is very strong on my heart about generations. I, I pray that you will catch this that God is wanting us to be people that just don't think for the now, but think generationally. We want our youth to be strong. We do not want a diluted youth and kids. We want them to be strong in the faith. So right place, right time. And Joshua 24, 15 says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I wonder if this is you. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, growing up, you know, you know there's a few fights you can't fight. Like, should I, you want them to wear the green top, but they want to wear the yellow top. That's a, you know, that's a fight you don't fight, right? But there's some fights you need to fight, like making prayer a priority in your home like reading the word, a priority in your home, coming to church, being church, part of church community, a priority in your home. Those are fights we need to start fighting, parents, to make sure our children are in church community. So church community, now coming to England was not easy. Uh, we, we came, uh, we were very involved, my husband and I, we were married for two years then, uh, when we came and my husband had this weird idea about coming to England. All he wanted to do was see Man United play, by the way. That was it. And I fell for it. Uh, but he promised that he will come for one year. And we will come for one year. And we arrived in England, like I said, 21 years ago. And uh, it was different. Everything was different. We've got some pictures of people that we met as soon as we came, that's our beautiful late Helen Levine that's gone to be with Jesus. But she was, uh, along with Bruce, her husband, they, I couldn't find a picture of Bruce. And I said, Bruce, I can't find, he said, don't worry. So I've got permission. But they were, just hang on, sorry, one second. You want to move very fast, yeah. Uh, but Helen, they, they were, they were uh, Bruce is South African, so they were like our South African parents in England. So we loved it. And then when my parents came over in 2002, they took lots of time and, and lots of, uh, you know, days out and, and lots of uh, attention were given and, and they were beautiful people that we met and our parents, uh, my parents met. And then the next picture, please. Edith, I did tell you two years ago, I'm putting your picture on. Surprise, your picture's in the book. But Edith is sitting here with us, and uh, Edith's a special lady, and uh, she loved my parents, you know, and spent so much time with them, taking them out. This is 2002 when they arrived as well, and special people we met when we came to the DC. And then the next picture is where we put it all together. Believe it or not, 2002, so my dad on the left, Nadine is three years old, Faith is five years old, Pastor Kath, my mom, Devotion, 
Pastor Jonathan in his glory days holding a football. That was uh, 20, 20 years ago. And we met these beautiful people. Remember when we arrived, you saw my launch. Everybody's brown in South Africa, right? I don't mean to be racist, but you know, and we come and there's a few brown dotted, but there's all white. They even spoke differently to us. They, they ate differently. You know, I've got to share this with you. Pastor Kat loves me, but I've got to share this with you. So when we came, so my husband's name is Diversion, not the easiest name. So for months, Pastor Kath was calling him Diversion. <laughs> then she started calling him Division. She was trying so hard to get his name. So, you know, I'm quite a blunt person. So after three months, I'm like, Kath, let's practice his name. So after two years, she got it right, but she got it. And, uh, <laughs> but, what, but what it was is things were so different. But, you know, when I came to England, I, I realized how important church community is. Because we didn't have our family here. And we just met these people that just loved us, took care of us. And uh, it was eye-opener to me because back home there was a safety net. There was dad, there was mom, there was family. We loved church. We were busy with, you know, we were involved in church life, in ministry. But it was, you know, was it just because it was dad's church and we were working towards it? But when we came here, there was the greatest sense of what community is. Now, for those of you that might be new and you're actually looking for a church, join a church that loves you, join a church where you're going to grow because the Lord talks about us being planted where we are. You cannot grow where you're not planted. Yeah, green leaf, tree, it will not grow if it's not planted, watered, fertilized. And that's what God taught me through one of the biggest life lessons as it's in the book about the power of church community, about the power of church, because Jesus died for the church. And today, if you are not planted in a church, get planted in a church. This is a great church. I'm, I'm biased. I've been here 21 years. But this is a great church. And why is this a great church? Because we want, we, because we desire for everybody to grow in Christ. We want to bring out the best in everyone. We love community. We love you guys that are here. You know, it's, Edith's been here for I don't know how long in all of the churches. But as far as I know, she's been with us. Most of you have been here a long time. Why? Because it's a family church, and that is why we are here. But there's one verse I'm going to read, which is Romans 12, verse 5. So we, who are many, are nevertheless just one body in Christ, and individually we are parts, one of another, mutually dependent on each other. The words mutually dependent does not talk about things being one-sided. You cannot come to church and say, what can you give me? We got to come with a mindset of, how can I serve too? And this is a brilliant church because everybody is serving. Everybody is doing their part. But mutual dependence, that is what church life, that is what church community is all about. And get rooted. You know, the Bible talks about wheat and chaff. Wheat is useful, shelf is just floating around. Let us become rooted in Christ and rooted in church life. Now, what is the crux of my book? There's so many things that you would read. There's 12 chapters, there's pictures, there's testimonies. But when my dad received his green leaf moment, he did not keep it for himself. He took every opportunity to share hope, to share testimony, to be an encouragement. You know, I had the opportunity to go to a few churches, to even a prayer meeting with a whole lot of ladies and, and talk about the book, 
to uh, pastors' fraternals, which is just when pastors meet together uh, to talk and then have lunch. It was great. We had lunch. But as I went to one of these pastors' fraternals, there were about 15 pastors there. And, uh, and as I stood up to talk, I said, some of you will know my dad. And they all resounded. They all knew my dad. They were just of that, age, of that era. And then afterwards, they all came with a, a short testimony of words that were, again, life-giving words that were impacted into their lives. Like one pastor said, you know, I went to your dad and I wanted to leave my secular job and your dad didn't ask me questions and, you know, so often we can go into all of these. All he said was, his name was Solly, he said, Solly, why don't you go and start studying the word? That's all he said. And today he's a pastor. He left his secular. And there were so many testimonies I could share. And it was all so good. And, I, and, it, and it spoke to me about, do I take every opportunity to share love? Do I share, take every opportunity to share hope to those around me? Be people that give life-giving words to those around you. And I was so encouraged by this. And 1 Peter 3 verse 15 says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This morning, share the hope that you have. This morning, as you sit, sit, sit here, do you have hope in Christ? Yeah, do you? Anybody? I hope you do. I hope you do. Yes, we do. We do have hope in Christ. And one of the key reasons that I endeavored to do my book is that, and as I was even writing this book, I can tell you that when you read the book, when my dad gave his life to Christ, his sister became a Christian and his sisters and cousins and family. Eventually, his dad became a Christian just before he passed away. But as I was writing the book, there are still many people in, in our family that are yet to know Jesus. And I, and I just sensed in my heart, if they would just pick up the book, just out of even curiosity and read about the goodness of Jesus, that will sow a seed. And, you know, as we were at the launch, many of our family that are yet to know Jesus were there. And one of my dad's niece, she went and she read the book. And I was so encouraged because she said she enjoyed the book. And that was a seed sown. And I just want to encourage you, those that are yet to know Jesus, those are the words that I kind of want to leave you with. Those that are yet to know Jesus. Now, as you sit where you're sitting, is there anyone here that has anybody in their world that are yet to know Jesus? Can I get you to put your hand up, yeah? That are yet to know Jesus. Nearly each one of us, even I have people that are yet to know Jesus in my world, my neighbors, my family, my friends. And you might be thinking, what do I do? And I'm going to share a few things for you. Now, number one is your private light of devotion. Now, why I'm talking about this is that you cannot give hope if you have no hope. Is that right? How can we talk about the hope that we have if we do not have hope? And this morning, maybe some of you have not had your green leaf moment and you do not know Jesus, but for those of you that do know Jesus, can I just encourage you your devotion, your time with Jesus. Why don't we start praying, as those of you that lifted your hands up, why don't we start praying specifically, intentionally, for those that are yet to know Jesus? At the end of this month, we have an awesome Alpha course, and that course explores the whole Christian faith. If you have any friends and family that are seeking and are not sure and have questions, the Alpha can answer your questions. It's just this non-threatening atmosphere where you come together, you, you watch a video about who is Jesus, why did he die, so forth, but it's an opportunity for us. Share your testimony. Any of you have a testimony that are sitting here about the goodness of God, yeah? Some of you, not a lot. Some of you do, some of you do. 
about the testimony about the goodness of God. You see, you know, Dr. Glenn Balfour came and he's like, brilliant, isn't he? You speak Hebrew and Greek. You don't need to speak Hebrew and Greek. You need to share your story. You don't need to know every single verse in the Bible. No, no. You need to share your story, the reason for the hope that you and I have. You know, my husband and my husband's dad have powerful stories. You'll read about it in the book. There's a testimony from my father-in-law in the book. You'll see uh, pictures of them being baptized. You'll see a picture of devotion when he, when he was 12. Now, that's the reason you want to buy the book. Um, but you will see powerful testimonies. And I always encourage the version and tell him, you have, because you probably one day share his testimony, and some of you will know his testimony. For those of you that don't know, go and see him. A lot of people are going to see him after the service. Uh, but yeah, powerful testimonies. But do we share those testimonies enough to those around us? Share the hope that we have. Now, some of you would have heard the story of how my dad became a Christian, so I'm going to repeat it because there's lots of new people here. The story of my dad, so my dad was a, a teacher, he taught Latin and he taught history, he loved to teach, teaching was what he loved, and it, it's a miracle how he even became a, a teacher because you find, as, as we talk in the book, they were very poverty-stricken in that generation. But he was sponsored to become a teacher. He went to college, became a teacher, loved his profession. And then there was a lady, and you would know her name because I've spoken about her before. Some of you know Patsy. Patsy was a colleague that uh, was with him teaching. And every lunch break, Patsy would catch my dad and invite him to church and say, Casey, you need to come to church. Casey, come to church. Let's talk about And my dad was like, no. He, my dad wanted to know nothing about the Christian faith. Actually, he hated the Christian faith. When his younger brother, Devraj, became a Christian, he threw the Bible at him because Devraj told him, God has great plans for you, and he hated it. He cussed, he swore at the Christian faith, a bit like Saul to Paul. And uh, Patsy, now my dad loved to read. That was my dad. Da dad loved to read. And one day, Patsy gave my dad the book of John. I carry the book of John around because this is a good testimony for me. So dad, uh, Patsy gives dad this book of John, and my dad says, oh, another book to read. And he goes home, and he reads the book of John. And the book of John changes my dad's life, and he gives his heart to Christ. That's a powerful testimony. I expected a better response than that. <laughs> I just think, though, sometimes... We think we need the power, great and wonderful things to happen around us. But in front of you, you have why Jesus's. You have try praying booklets. These are powerful tools that you could use to share God. Just as Patsy gave my dad the book of John, and because of that, that's that was a seed that was sown, and that's why I am standing here. That's why I've even written a book. Look at that, look at that, what an impact we can make for generations to come. The Lord calls us all to be ambassadors for him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 says, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You see, God calls us to be co-workers for him. He calls us to be representatives for him. And sometimes we need to get ourselves right to be representatives, but all it takes is sharing your life, sharing the reason of your hope, sharing your testimony with others. So this morning... I'm not sure if you are wanting to be an ambassador for Jesus, but I can tell you that God is calling us as a church. He's calling us as individuals for those that are yet to know Jesus, which is why I've even written the book, so that those that read it can find hope in Jesus. 
for those that read it can say, wow, we serve a God of miracles. We serve a God that can do great things. We serve a God that can change uh, Pastor Casey's life from somebody that hated Christianity to somebody that loves Jesus with all their heart, who surrenders everything to him. And that is the power of our God. But it's not about us. Pastor Jonathan spoke a powerful scripture. It's not about us, but it's Christ within us, the hope of glory. It's what God is able to do within us. So this book is not about me. It's about what God has done through me. And here you have a product. And this morning, God calls us all to be ambassadors for him. And I'm just going to finish with this verse. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 to, do, 1 to 2 says, As God co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Church, now is the time. Like never before, now is the time where we decide on generations to come, where our decisions now will decide on generations to come. What we decide with our kids is gonna determine generations to come. How we live our lives now will determine what's gonna happen in the future. We serve a God of the big picture. We serve a God that looks on the aerial view at each one of us. And he has a powerful plan and destiny for each one of you. And this morning, I just, I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray for those that may not have received their green leaf moment. And I just want to, uh, you know, I don't want to, to, to frighten you, but I just want to tell you that we serve a powerful God. We serve a God of hope. We serve a God of peace. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. And this morning, I, I just sense that some of you, you do not have peace. And the Prince of Peace is right here in our midst. The Prince of Peace is wanting to do a work in your heart and in your life right now. You know, when I was a little girl, I, uh, I used to be very excitable. If it's sports day or if it's my birthday or something, I'm still like that. But, you know, when I was little and when I would go down and my mom will be busy sewing and my dad will be reading and I just go and sit at my dad's knee and place my head on his knee and he would just place his hand on me and I'd feel like restful. And today the Lord is saying, will you come to me? You know, like our Mary came and sat at the feet of Jesus. Will you just come and sit at the feet of Jesus as it were today? And I'm just gonna pray for you right now, for those that are feeling like you do not have peace. You might be in a situation where you have no peace. And the Lord is saying, I wanna give you peace. I want to give you hope. I want to renew your strength. I want to renew your joy. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now, Lord, for all those that do not have peace, that you, the Prince of Peace, will just come right now into their situation, that you will touch their hearts, that you will touch their lives, that you will just bless them from the in side out. There will be a renewal. There'll be a refreshing. There'll be um, a, a removal of things that are not of you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we pray that. I pray for peace over us as a congregation, peace over us as families, peace over us as connect groups, peace over us as a church, in Jesus' name. For those of you that are, do not know Jesus and you, you haven't had that green leaf moment, that, that moment of salvation, that moment of coming to Jesus, if you are here today, you can put your hand up or you can just quietly say this prayer, but I don't want to miss that opportunity this morning because I tell you what, that is the greatest decision you will ever make for you, for your family, and for generations to come.
The decision you make now, today, this moment right now, will become stories of destiny for generations to come. So Lord, I just pray, and you can pray this, you can echo this prayer if you are here and you do not know Jesus and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart right now. Change my heart. I accept you as the Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I believe that you are the Son of God. I confess my sins before you. And I say, Lord, you come and you be the King of my life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And the last thing I just want to pray, and we'll just stand right now, and those that are yet to know Jesus, which is, like I said, the crux of, of the book, Green Leaf Moment. If there's anybody in your world, anybody that you know that are yet to know Jesus, and you have a burden for them, you want to see them come to Jesus because there'll be a turnaround in their life. I just want you to put your hand up, even as we pray right now, and in faith believe that God can do powerful things. Lord, we just pray. I pray, Lord, for those that are yet to know you, that even as we represent those that are yet to know you, that this will be a harvest field that is going out right now, we will become the laborers of that harvest field right now, even as we put our hands up in faith that this is the harvest field of souls for destiny. This is the harvest field of souls for your kingdom. So Lord, we pray, even as I can see representatives of hands for spouses, for children, for, for grandparents, for cousins, for, for aunts, for, for neighbors, for colleagues, for whoever it is, Lord. We pray, Lord, that there will be such a faith that rises up, Lord, that we will believe for the salvation of the lost, Lord. We will believe, Lord, that you will do a new thing amongst us. Lord, we will believe, Lord, for the lost to come to you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. 